This is the micro effect. www.themicroeffect.com. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. There was a mighty nation, blessed above all of creation. It was a rare and precious pearl. Conceived in faith and liberty, home of the brave, land of the free. It was the envy of the world. But this shining city on a hill has turned from the Creator's will and let evil take control. Now the reckless men who lead them want to strip away their freedom and to steal their very soul. Now it's smoke and mirrors, switch and bait, criticize and confiscate and let the guilty walk away. In this once righteous, godly nation, in the halls of education, they forbid a child to pray. They say we need to spread the wealth. They pretend to guard the health of the feeble and the poor. While the hand they hold behind their back confuses and conceals the fact that the wolf is at the door. There's an unseen hand that pulls the string. It makes it a little Welcome. Radio Free America. Welcome to the Micro Effect Radio Network. And uh, my name is Dan Happel, and my show is Connecting the Dots with Dan Happel. And I welcome our listeners this week. Uh, this week we are having a special whistleblower week. And uh, for, for that uh, program, my first guest uh, today, uh, well, my only guest today, uh, will be Mary Fanning and Alan Jones. And uh, Mary and Alan are reporters. Uh, they work for, uh, the, they write for the American Report. Uh, they also have uh, very, very close ties with the security uh, community. And they are going to expose today uh, a project called uh, Port Canaveral. I know some of my listeners are uh, listen to my Thursday night show as well, and they have been on there several times. But I also know that many of our listeners on this network have never heard this information before. So we want to make this uh, really a, a report that most people in America, I'm sure, are completely unaware of and a security threat that is almost inconceivable in its nature and its scope. So uh, with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Mary Fanning. Mary, would you like to give a little bit of your background, and then uh, we'll introduce Alan. Yes, Dan, it's nice to be with you. Thank you for having us. Uh, my background is I started working with people in, in – um, retired military analysts, other journalists, to bring the truth to the American people because of what had happened with the journal list under uh, President Barack Obama. There were a group of journalists that were coming together, and they were bringing stories forward, as, as uh, Ben Rhodes said, creating an echo chamber. But the echo chamber was they were bringing false information to the American people who, as Cass Sunstein said, they believed were, would believe anything, that we were um, a bunch of idiots. And so uh, we decided to start working together and to, to reverse engineer the journal list and bring the truth to the American people. We work with people who are uh, retired analysts, retired CIA, retired military, and those who also had websites uh, for, that were news aggregators. And uh, we worked together, and the first thing we did, um, with the backing of General Paul Vallely, a true patriot, uh, is we, we put together the Gutter Awareness Program, um, Stop Qatar Now. 
and that was because the Muslim Brotherhood is headquartered out of Qatar, and they were infiltrating every every aspect of our government, and it was important um, to to begin exposing that because people were concerned that Sharia law was being implemented. And if you're implementing Sharia law, you're subverting the Constitution. That was our first. And then we put together a series um, uh, that I'm very proud of, the Betrayal Papers. And the Betrayal Papers um, not only spoke to the Muslim Brotherhood and ISNA in America, but also who Barack Obama is, and we could only um, define him by his associations. And then Alan and I started working on uh, Port Canaveral, which we've been working on truly for just about three years. And uh, that brings us to today. Okay, great. Uh, Alan, I know you've got uh, similar credentials, but you've got some things that you've worked on that are a little different. And uh, would, you, would you like to tell our listeners some of the things that you've worked on? Sure. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us onto your program today. We're looking forward to sharing some of the information that we've gathered with your listeners because it is very important in understanding the threat that affects every American, no matter where they live, whether it's California or Florida or New York or even uh, our overseas military. A little about my background. I actually um, spent a little bit of time in Washington, D.C. when I was in college and did a um, a summer internship there and actually worked in the environmental field and came in contact with a lot of information about uh, nuclear weapons production. That was really my first uh, exposure to uh, nuclear weapons. And when you, when you start to look at them every day, you really start to realize uh, how dangerous they are and uh, how important the Cold War was and the threat that we've uh, been facing really since the 1940s when the Soviets started to steal all of our secrets and race to start their own nuclear program. And we've been dealing with that threat ever since. They've since then gone on to share that technology with many rogue regimes. And then I, um, I, was, I was very impacted by the 9-11 attacks. Um, I worked in uh, an industry that was directly affected by that. And uh, actually found myself at one point uh, drawn to go down to ground zero just six days after the attack. And uh, I think I've carried that with me ever since. And it gives a perspective that when you start to uncover the kind of information that we're now compiling, that these threats are very real. And that 9-11, as bad as it was, and as tragic as it was, may be only a precursor to something much worse that's in the works. That's our greatest fear. I was fortunate enough to have an opportunity to work as a, uh, a citizen journalist uh, at the Washington Times Communities, which uh, gave an opportunity for me to spread my wings. I did a lot of national security reporting there, um, did some investigation of Barack Obama's background. I uh, did a, uh, broke some stories on the Navy Yard shooting involving Aaron Alexis. Um, also, some uh, stories connected to the Boston bombing. And as Mary said, you know, we've been working over three years now on the Port Canaveral story, which has really consumed us because there's so many tentacles and the story continues to expand. And we follow every lead that we uncover. And it's, it's, you know, it's like a giant jigsaw puzzle. Okay, well, uh, I know it is, and I, we, we've had the, you folks on the radio, I think now a total of, well, this will be the fifth time uh, to talk about this. And I want our listeners to understand that, uh, you know, there is so much more here than, than you will ever hear from the lamestream media. Uh, we are talking about things that you won't find reported anywhere else. And so, uh, Mary and Alan, would you briefly summarize your December 23, 2016 report, what could possibly go wrong? And then we'll, we'll kind of get into the meat of the uh, Port Canaveral deal and, 
if you would do it in a way that just kind of uh, fleshes this out, uh, assuming that none of our listeners have heard any of this before. Okay. And Mary, would December you go ahead and start with that? Yes, I'll give you a quick overview of that. Um, it, at that point, we saw that Port Canaveral handed out under um, a, a, a program known as Project Pelican that handed out a 35-year lease to a Middle Eastern company. It was disturbing because of after the Dubai Ports World deal and the consternation that America felt when they saw that six ports had been given away to the UAE, uh, this deal was announced and signed on the same day. As we looked into it, we found that the same people had tried to take over Port Jacksonville, and they were turned down when it came out in, in their local papers that there was a $250 million um, under the table to be a silent partner. And so the idea that they were handing off Port Jacksonville as a silent partner to a foreign entity was disturbing because Kings Bay, our nuclear submarines, were also berthed right there at uh, Port Jacksonville. And so as we started looking into uh, this 35-year lease that was announced and signed all on the same day, and it was breaking Florida's sunshine laws because it, it, it was the open bidding process was bypassed. You know, people weren't allowed to bid. It was simply announced. And it, it didn't have the time constraints where they had to announce it, have the open bidding. And so it was very strange that that took place. And, and so we'd written about that, and we knew a certain amount. But then after we published that, we continued to dig into this. And, and it was disturbing that they were handing off a port to a, a, a UAE company. After we published all that and we found out who, in fact, Gulf Tainer was and who they had given this 35-year lease that did not have CFIA, so it didn't have the normal national security review that it was mandated under the 2007 FINSA laws, well, when we found out who Gulf Tainer was and who owned it and what their background was, that was incredibly disturbing because Gulf Tainer is owned by the Jaffers, Hamid Jaffer, um, the principal, he was under investigation by the Treasury Department and three congressional committees for Saddam Hussein's oil for food scheme. So he was selling oil illegally under false pretenses, under false fronts, downstreaming, hiding, hiding who they were, in order to fund Saddam Hussein's nuclear weapons program. So that was his oil for super weapons program. Well, as we looked into it, the man leading Saddam Hussein's nuclear weapons, his WMD program, was Hamid Jaffer's brother, Dr. Jaffadia Jaffer. So Hamid is working the, the scheme in order to fund not only Saddam's WMD program, but also his brother's WMD program. As we looked into that and we found CIA documents, we found that Dr. Jaffadia Jaffer was not only working on Saddam's nuclear program, but so too his uh, weapons and biological program. When Okay, now uh, let, let me um, uh, ask you to kind of uh, uh, talk a little bit more about uh, the uh, Barrage Group and, uh, you know, Gulptainer and some of the connections that they have, besides just the Jeffers, uh, that they, they have uh, also connections uh, to other groups and how that is tied in with, uh, really, with Barack Obama's administration. Okay, great question. So to step back a little bit, when, when in 2014 this, Un, you know, unknown here in America, container company came in really by surprise. They tried to market themselves as 
a Western style company based in the UAE, which is considered, quote, a U.S. ally. That's actually very debatable. But they really sold themselves as a transparent, um, modern company. And their um, chief spokesperson running the company is a man named Peter Richards, who's um, says that he's from, uh, that he's a British citizen and speaks with a British accent. So for the casual observer, this didn't seem like that big a deal. Okay, you know, it's a company from Dubai. They've got this British guy. Um, sounds like he's, you know, um, he says that he's from a background in the merchant marines. We don't really actually know that much about him. But um, this is what they sold. But as Mary was explaining, they they are actually very deeply connected to Saddam loyalists who were involved heavily in at the highest levels in Saddam's WMD program, nuclear, chemical, biological. Dr. Jaffer was considered such a threat that the Pentagon under uh, Rumsfeld added Dr. Jaffer's name to CENTCOM's blacklist, which was a classified list that was given to commanders in Iraq clarifying which regime figures were legitimate military targets that could be engaged as under the laws of war as military targets. And Dr. Jaffer's name was on that list as a senior advisor to President Hussein and as well as technology transfer expert. So he was involved in procuring technology that they used in these WMD programs and the materials that they needed to do this. Now, the corporate structure of the Gulftainer Limited, which is based in Dubai, they did a downstreaming in which they created these subsidiaries uh, in a trade zone in Sharjah, UAE. And then down at the bottom of the list, they created a new company that they incorporated first in Delaware and then in Florida called GTUSA. Now, this is all under the umbrella of the Crescent Group, which is been around for a long time, and this was run by Hamid Jaffer. The Crescent Group has a number of subsidiaries and affiliates, one of which was Crescent Petroleum, which was the company that was being investigated as a front company for Saddam in the Oil for Super Weapons program that Mary just mentioned. Now, within the Crescent Group, they have Crescent Investments, and they were very... Um, upfront about the fact that they were involved with the Abraj Group, which is a private equity group based in Pakistan and run by Pakistani. And Hamid Jaffer is a founding shareholder of the Abraj Group. So they were one of the first investors. Furthermore, Badr Jaffer, who is Hamid's son and nuclear scientist Dr. Jaffer's nephew, is on the board of directors at, a, at the Abraj Group. Furthermore, at the Abraj Group, you have Wahid Hamid, who was one of President Obama's Pakistani friends that his circle, they actually called them like the, I think they called them the Paki mob. This was, this, these were the guys that were running around with Obama at Occidental College. They were foreign students that were here on foreign student visas. Um, Shandu was another one, and they were also involved in Obama's trip to Pakistan in 1981 that during the campaign in 2008 no one knew about until he mentioned it while he tried to boast about his foreign uh, credentials in, while he was running against Hillary in the primaries. Everybody all of a sudden was like, wait, what a minute, you went to Pakistan? Why didn't we know about this? And then in the course of investigating how Port Canaveral's container terminal was handed off to this company, we find these names turning up, like Wahid Hamid at the Abraz Group and Vinay Thamalapoli, who was another person uh, Obama knew, and they were roommates. They spent the summer together uh, in Los Angeles, and he was uh, appointed a brand-new position at Commerce called Select USA, in which he was tasked with bringing in foreign direct investment, such as Gulf Tainer. He uh, traveled to Sharjah, and then he came to Port Canaveral for the opening ceremony. So we have here two people from Obama's early life 
one from India, the other one from Pakistan, who are involved in this very shady deal. So that led us to wonder more about, well, what is the Abraj Group? And the Abraj Group is a private equity group. They've uh, given money to the Clinton Global Initiative. That was revealed in WikiLeaks, actually, and we wrote about that at Breitbart. Uh, furthermore, they've had uh, connections to uh, KE Electric, which was a power company uh, based in Karachi, which has since been sold to the Chinese. And there was a scandal there in Pakistan and involving connections to uh, someone uh, involved in a hospital for ISIS and other uh, terrorist activities. Okay. Well, uh, one thing I wanted to uh, really get into here is how the uh, normal security procedures were completely circumvented uh, by President Obama and uh, Hillary Clinton at the State Department and how this uh, Port Canaveral deal not only didn't get the normal uh, scrutiny that uh, a transaction like this would require under the law, it was uh, completely uh, ignored and and really let in under the wire. So uh, can, can you guys kind of explain that to our listeners as well? Yeah, let's step back a little bit to that that trip to Pakistan. When Barack Obama went to Pakistan at that point in time, Americans were not allowed into Pakistan. So when he mentioned that, it was very interesting that he was there at all. And so that his Occidental roommates and his friends were traveling with him and that they were also the same people that show up in this deal, and um, Hamid Wahid is on the Abraj group, and Vanessa Malapoli is Select USA, and that he shows up giving speeches in Sharjah with these same people uh, made that pretty interesting. So as we started looking into that trip and we and understand who the people were who were with him, that there was a lot more to them. And one of the, you have to understand that um, Chandu, so Chandu was his friend that he lived with. And so when we looked into him, um, he was mentioned on the day that Obama was sworn into office in the New York Times. And it was a story about the roommates. And when we looked into Chandu, we, only to find out that he is a Jinnah. The Jinnahs are the, the Shiite family that had broken off from India, and, and so his great-grandfather was one who created Pakistan. And so that started to give us a little context on who exactly Barack Obama was hang, hanging out with. This isn't just, you know, any old person that's come over from another country. He's pretty much the royalty of Pakistan. And when we looked into um, Vinay, while he comes from India, He's related. The rest of his family uses a different last name. He's married to a woman where he, um, they believe in, in taking the mother's last name. But when we looked into Vinay's family, it looks like he's related to the Reddings of India, who are, um, again, very prominent. All of his siblings go by that name. They don't use the same name that he does. And it appears that they are the uh, family that founded the Communist Party in India. Uh, they also appear to own all the uranium, big amount of uranium mines in India. So, wow, that that that's great information, Mary. Um, that I didn't I didn't even realize that from our previous show that uh, that that family connection was the way it is. Well. It, as we start looking into that trip, you, you know, it, it doesn't look like Barack Obama is just anybody. He, and he's hanging out with some pretty heady company that are, you know, um, not just rather well healed, but but apparently very powerful in in those countries. And as we look into it, we start seeing that he is in touch with Benazir Bhutto, and. These same people all go to her sister's wedding 
with him together. And her sister is, Benazir's sister is visiting Obama in his, at his apartment. And so this becomes a lot more interesting that the people that he's, that he's you know, his hang, who's hanging out with, and he's so casual, um, as we look into Benazir Bhutto and Shyam Bhatia, is an author that wrote Under the Baghdad Sun, but he's also written books on, on Benazir Bhutto. And as we look into Benazir Bhutto, she becomes much more interesting to us because Benazir Bhutto is the one who had um, taken the discs, and with the nuclear information, she had snuck this in her pocket overseas. This is during the Clinton administration, and handed the information over to the North Koreans. And, and as we look into Benazir Bhutto, I had no idea of her history. She refers to herself as the mother of the nuclear bomb. Wow. So we start seeing that this has an awful lot of nuclear connections and uranium connections. It's, it's worth noting that these are the people that Obama, his secret trip that no one knew about, and that he was very careful to start covering it up. I'm, as, I'm sure people who have studied Obama understand that they believe that you know his family has CIA connections, the Dunhams do, and that his mother worked for the Ford Foundation, and the Ford Foundation had very strong communist ties. And in right, fact, his right. mother well, was... Go ahead, go Dan. Ahead. Mm -hmm. His mother was um, <clears throat> living in Pakistan for five years in Lahore, and it's um, it's never really you just don't see that information out there that 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 those connections. Well, you know, it, it, uh, a lot of things and a lot of the comments that have been made is how uh, Barack Obama can come from real humble background and. And, you know, our first black president could come from such hum humble beginnings and uh, be elected president. Uh, when, in fact, when I think you peel the curtain back, you realize that uh, this, this whole process is incredibly orchestrated. And those who uh, think that this is all just, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, poor black hit from, uh, from Hawaii or you know, back, well, not Pakistan, but Indonesia and Hawaii and all this, uh, you start to kind of peel the layers back. You realize there's a lot more to this than most people have any idea about. No, <clears throat> we've been peeling the layers back for several years. Um, we did a piece, um, Clues to Obama's Mysterious Idea and, and Who His Connections, but one of the things that's just interesting to help put some of that in context is that it's very interesting that um, Barack Obama, going back until the time he started at Occidental, was connected to Prince Talal that was just arrested in Saudi Arabia. Mary, uh, we're, we're going into a commercial break right now, but we'll be back on the other side of the half hour. And uh, keep that thought in mind, and we'll continue with that conversation. This is the Micro Effect. www.themicroeffect.com. Well, welcome back to our listeners to Connecting the Dots. And, Mary, every time I have a conversation with you, I'm absolutely fascinated with the level and depth of background information that you bring to every one of these discussions and I know Alan you're the same way uh, you have done so much research you have so much background on so many different things but you know the bottom line is is that uh, we uh, through you are learning a great deal more about Barack Obama and the connections to a lot of Middle Eastern uh, characters let's say 
And there is so much more to this because of the Port Canaveral deal and some of the national security risks that are associated with this, and that's something that we will, luckily we have uh, another hour and a half, we will get into some great detail on that. But, uh, Mary, go ahead and, and uh, finish your thoughts that uh, you had before the break, and then maybe let's talk about how the uh, uh, normal security procedure for Gulf Tainer or for the Port, uh, Port Canaveral deal were circumvented. How they were bypassed. Yeah, it's important to know the background because it gives us context when we learn new information, that we consider some of the background information that we know. And one of the pieces that um, we had written a piece on, uh, it's clues, it's on our, our own website, the AmericanReport.org and 1776 channel. And one of the things that brought that background information into today is what just took place in Saudi Arabia, where they ar arrested Prince Talal, who um, was basically Barack Obama's uh, patron and the man that helped to get him into Harvard Law. He was also, he owns a, a big piece of 26th, uh, 20th Century Fox. He owns um, a nice piece of Facebook and so he's a very, very multi-multi-billionaire Saudi prince, and he was just arrested on corruption charges. Um, prince Talal and Barack Obama go back to Barack's days at Occidental. Percy Sutton was a Manhattan borough president, and he came out, and you can find this on YouTube, and Percy Sutton said, my friend Khalid al-Mansur this attorney from the Middle East, who was the attorney to OPEC, reached out to me and said, can you help get my friend into Harvard Law? And I said, sure, I'll write a letter for him. And so the man that, that, that uh, Khalid al-Mansur was working for was Prince Talal. So Percy Sutton tells how he got him into Harvard Law for Khalid al-Mansur. Prince Talal is the man that Khalid Al-Mansur was working for as part of OPEC for the Saudi royal family and their oil holdings. Well, it turns out that Khalid Al-Mansur is actually, um, a.k.a. also known as Donald Warden. Donald Warden was the founder of the Black Panthers. So that gives you an idea who, and so Khalid Al-Mansur and Prince Talal they hook up in California when they're both in uh, college and law school, and they start a law firm together. And so Prince Talal, Khalid al-Mansur, and Obama go way back to Obama's college days. Prince Talal then makes a $20 million donation to Harvard Law, and Percy Sutton follows through on his recommendation at the um, request of Khalid al-Mansur, who is actually Don Warden of the Black Panthers. Now, the Black Panthers was a violent um, an group of anarchists. Interestingly, Khalid al-Mansur left the Black Panthers because they were bringing in radicals, but they were bringing in radicals that were white, and he objected to any white radicals, so he left. And uh, that's when he left the Black Panthers. So these are the wow. people who inform us uh, that that this is who Obama's connected to. And so we see not only the, the, the radical nature of these people, but they're also um, Middle Easterners, which brings us to Port well, Canaveral. You know, and I, I want to remind our listeners that, you, first of all, you wouldn't hear this information anywhere on the so-called mainstream media. But we also want to remind our listeners that uh, under the law, if this information is inaccurate, if, if this really is a defamation issue, uh, Mary, you and Alan and all these people that are reporting on this stuff would be uh, risking huge lawsuits. And the point is they don't do that because, in fact, this stuff is true and they want to keep the lid on everything. And 
one of the things that uh, pops out to me uh, with this whole process is just exactly how corrupted the so-called mainstream media is that they aren't reporting on this stuff. This is huge. This is absolutely the most critically important information, especially for, uh, you know, the presidency of the United States. And the fact that not only was Barack Obama a one-term president, but he was a two-term president, and his uh, fingerprints are all over so many really, really awful processes and procedures. And uh, so let's get into, in some detail, how the Port Canaveral deal came about and how all those things were circumvented and that way we can start talking about some of the security risks that are associated with that. Well, in reference to the mainstream media, you're absolutely right. They, you could, It would be giving them the benefit of the doubt to say that they're asleep at the wheel. I think there's some awareness of this story and that they are intentionally holding the story back, uh, much like much like uh, Newsweek held back the Monica Lewinsky story until Matt Drudge broke it. In fact, on the Trump campaign trail, I actually briefed the CBS Evening News White House correspondent extensively on this story, gave him a complete report, and they chose not to cover it. So they continue to hold back this information. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, um, Alan, would you like to kind of lead into maybe the conversation about the uh, Port Canaveral deal and how, how all the normal uh, procedures, uh, security procedures, were uh, totally ignored and, and not only ignored, but they were intentionally uh, circumvented? Sure. So foreign investment has always been a double-edged sword. You know, on the one hand, when foreign companies come in, like let's say, for example, BMW wants to open a factory in South Carolina, you know, that can create a lot of jobs, and that's not really a security risk. However, some companies are. Now, Dubai Ports World became really the poster child for foreign investment, which was considered a security risk. For those listeners who aren't familiar, this, this story was in 2006. A company called Dubai Ports World, which was wholly owned by the UAE government, moved to purchase um, basically control of five or six major U.S. ports from uh, P&O, which was a British company at the time. And there were procedures at that time called CFIUS, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. And CFIUS actually approved of the deal. But when Congress found out about this, there was such an uproar, not just from Republicans, but from a lot of Democrats, including uh, Hillary Clinton, who you might have heard of her, uh, Bernie Sanders, you might have heard of him. They both went on the record and said, this is terrible. You know, um, we can't risk Port security, having these foreign companies come in. Then, after this debacle with Dubai Ports World, which was under um, the advice of Bill Clinton, so Bill Clinton was really acting on behalf of the UAE government, ad advising them on how to maneuver to gain control of these American ports. This was during the Bush administration. So then, in 2007, Congress passed new regulations called FINSA, Foreign Investment National Security Act of 2007, which strengthened the procedures under CFIUS. They laid out a lot of specifics about what can constitute a national security risk, and there was a lot of discussion in the language of FINSA about critical infrastructure, which would in include, obviously, a, a maritime port, as well as national security installations. So if you have a company come in and they're too close to a Air Force base or a Navy base, as is the case with Gulf Tainer, that should automatically trigger this investigation. Now, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States is a multi-agency um, committee led by the Treasury Department, but the representatives that sit on the CFIUS board or the CFIUS panel 
from other agencies like Defense, Homeland Security, Energy, Commerce. Furthermore, um, the Director of National Intelligence, who during the Gulf Tainer deal was James Clapper, uh, also plays a role in CFIUS decisions. The Treasury Department can ask the DNI, the Director of National Intelligence, to conduct a full national security investigation with input from 16 different U.S. intelligence agencies. We're talking, you know, Defense Intelligence, CIA, NSA, FBI, um, National Reconnaissance Office, Geospatial, FBI, all of them. Uh, NASA even has its own intelligence agency. So they all have an opportunity over a, uh, either the short 30-day investigation or the second stage 45-day investigation to compile these reports and pull in all this information. Now, the Treasury Department, because they had already investigated the Crescent groups, uh, Crescent Petroleum back in the 1990s when Hamid Jaffer was involved in this oil for super weapons program to the scheme was they were going to sell Iraqi oil to then fund his brother's secret nuclear bomb program. So the Treasury Department's office of, uh, uh, they have like their own intelligence unit at Treasury and they were, they were investigating this. So there's no way the Treasury Department is going to be able to come forward if this goes to a hearing and say that we didn't know about this because it's in their own records. Furthermore, multiple congressional committees had investigated Gulf Tainer. So with that background, with all this knowledge that our government already had about these guys, that Dr. Jaffer had been on the Pentagon's CENTCOM blacklist, right, as an enemy combatant, and that they had briefed commanders in the theater that Jaffer was wanted, that he went on the run, he eventually surrendered and then was interrogated extensively by the FBI and by British intelligence. So they knew who these people were. So how is it that Gulf Tainer secretly negotiates for several years after their Jacksonville deal fell through, which coincidentally, Jacksonville is a very sensitive national security port. Uh, it's near uh, the Navy's uh, Mayport uh, base, which is uh, – uh, aircraft carriers are over there, and of course the Kings Bay submarine base is about 30 miles north, right over the Georgia border, which is our most important uh, Trident ballistic missile base on the East Coast, uh, basically going you know toe to toe with Russia. Very very important part of our nuclear triad. So how is is it that this company comes in, and supposedly they actually voluntarily submitted a CFIUS application with assistance from the port and turned in paperwork. Now, the CFIUS process, one of the big problems with it is that it's all classified, not transparent at all. They submit an annual report to Congress, two versions. There's a classified version, and then there's a version they release to the public. Now, the last report that they filed was for 2015, and they were over a year late on that. And I think they were reluctant to put this information out because that covered the time period when this deal was going through. But how is it they, that they submit the CFIUS paperwork? It then goes to the Treasury Department to a man named Eamon Meir, who was the staff chairperson at CFIUS. Now, that's a career position of the Treasury Department. He came over there from Wilmer Hale, a law firm that's connected to Robert Mueller. And he was placed in the Treasury Department in this important national security position. And then he was there during both the Uranium One deal with Rosatom, the Russian atomic agency, as well as the Gulf Tainer deal. So the initial application would have cost his death. In fact, during the Uranium One deal, members of Congress wrote a letter to Eamon Muir that was then to be, uh, it was care of Eamon Muir was to, get, to go to Timothy Geithner, the Treasury Secretary, expressing alarm that this Uranium One deal was going to be uh, severely impact U.S. national security, yet the deal was approved. Now, with Gulf Tainer, supposedly the CFIUS application, which is voluntary, was submitted to the Treasury Department. Now, Duncan Hunter... Jr., who was 
a congressman from California who who had served in the U.S. Marine Corps in Iraq had been the only one in Congress, really, who pulled the fire alarm on Gulf Tainer and said, wait a minute, because his father was very involved in the whole Dubai Ports World debacle. And so here, Duncan Jr., Duncan Hunter Jr., writes a letter to the Treasury Department and says, please do a full national security review of this company. We need to know who these people are. Well, the Treasury Department then <clears throat> apparently wrote a letter to Port Canaveral, and we have not been able to obtain a copy of this letter. Uh, the Orlando Sentinel newspaper apparently has seen it. And in the letter, uh, it is argued that this didn't require a national security review because it was, quote, two berths, which a berth is basically a dock where you can tie up a container ship or whatever sort of cargo ship or even a cruise ship. It said it was two berths and a few unused acres, and it was a lease. Therefore, no national security review is required. So these guys got a free pass. Now, remember, who was this application going to go through? It was going to go through Eamon Muir's office at the Treasury Department. So what did he – part of his job is to coordinate all the staff members in CFIUS to gather the preliminary information to then present to the cabinet-level people that sit on the CFIUS board for Uranium One, for Gulf Tainer, for any other deal. And so they should have done the preliminary investigation to get enough information to say, hey, this is enough of a national security risk that we need to do a formal 30-day investigation, probably a second stage 45-day investigation, we need to bring in the Director of National Intelligence and get the whole intel community looking at this very closely before we decide how to advise the president. Now, CFIUS has the ability to recommend to the president that either he approves something or the president can actually um, deny a deal. So CFIUS could have gone to President Obama and said, uh, you know, this Gulf Tainer deal is, looks really bad. It's going to be a risk to our submarine programs, a risk to NASA, a risk to our uh, CIA satellite program, et cetera, et cetera. Likewise, they could have advised that this was the Uranium One was a risk because Russia was going to get access to our uranium reserves. Neither of that happened. Eamon Mir was there, and uh, I'll let Mary tell you a little bit more about him. But uh, that's a little bit of an overview of how it's supposed to work under CFIUS, and it completely failed. Okay, and, and uh, I, I want to mention, and I want you guys to flesh this out a little bit, exactly strategically how important Port Canaveral is because of its uh, critical uh, proximity to some of uh, America's uh, best uh, national security and, and NASA uh, technology. So, uh, Mary, go ahead and uh, finish uh, finish Alan's thought on the uh, the CFIUS process, but then explain how important this uh, this critical military infrastructure really is. Well, it's important to note that the first thing that would have happened when they looked into this process was that they would have seen that the the Jeffers and Gulf Tainer were connected, were SDNs, and those are specially designated nationals. And they would have found that Hamid Jaffer was a business partner with Igor Sechin, the, uh, known as the most dangerous man, uh, the most dangerous and scariest man on earth, and very close to Vladimir Putin. And so the fact that they were specially designated nationals meant that if you're doing business with people like that, you're not allowed to do business in the United States. Beyond that, if you have anything to do with WMDs, and so here is Hamid Jaffer, well-known because he's been investigated in Congress for funding Saddam and his brother's WMD program, he's also an, an SDN, a specially designated national, not allowed to do business in the United States. So the way the operation appears to have been run is that they put Eamon Meir, at the Treasury Department, so he receives the information and he gives it to those who sit on the, the CFIUS board. Eamon Mir, however, is a man who was um, in the two-time president of MINA, 
which is part of ISNA, Islamic Society of North America. Eamon Muir's father was on the Founders Committee of the Islamic Society of North America. A man that he works with on the Kashmiri program is um, also Gulam Eamon, Eamon Fay, F-A-I. Mr. Fay was arrested by our FBI because he was handing out $3 million in Washington, D.C., buying influence, and it turned out he was working for the ISI, the Pakistani Intelligence. <clears throat> so a man very closely associated with Eamon Mir's father, who founded ISNA, is, it turns out, working as a spy and buying influence in the United States. He was put on trial, put in prison. And so when you see that those are the connections and the tight connections with the Islamic Society of North America which were found to be co-conspirators and were funding Hamas and terrorism and the Holy Land Foundation trial, there's no way that this could have, by, this could have passed a CFIUS review. They would have been immediately flagged for a couple of reasons, starting with the SDNs. Beyond that, when you're looking that this is not, this is not just any port, this is critical military infrastructure. At Port Canaveral, our Trident submarines are there. Our, the NATO Trident submarines are there, so that's a, a basin where they're refilled. Our, we have uh, two, air, two Air Force out there. We have, um, our, it's really our Space, Air, and Sea Command are all headquartered, or uh, their command is right out of Port Canaveral not to mention the H-4B plane that goes in and out of there, that should we ever end up in a nuclear war, that's command central. Uh, Mary, I, it sounds like we're heading into another commercial break, but uh, please, on the other side of the hour, let's, uh, let's get into this discussion of the importance of Port Canaveral, and then we can start talking more about the research that you folks have done over the past nine months. This is the Micro Effect. www.themicroeffect.com You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. There was a mighty nation blessed above all of creation It was a rare and precious pearl Conceived in faith and liberty Home of the brave, land of the free was the envy of the world But this shining city on a hill Has turned from the Creator's will And let evil take control Now the reckless men who lead them Want to strip away their freedom And to steal their very soul Well, welcome back to Connecting the Dots, and we have our uh, special whistleblower uh, radio show today, and I want to mention before, I, uh, before we get too far into the show, and I don't have time to do it, uh, Debbie boscalupi has got her Radioactive Wednesday program, and she's got a special whistleblower program as well, and she will be talking with IRS whistleblower Sherry Peel Jackson and uh, Department of the Interior whistleblower Dr. Paul Hauser, and that will be tomorrow from nine to eleven. And I strongly urge my listeners to tune in for that show. I think uh, Debbie is turning out to be a real superstar of the uh, radio uh, broadcasting programs, and she is doing a terrific job. And I just want to make sure that our listeners tune in to her and also to uh, Jim White on his radio show on Monday mornings from 9 to 11. And uh, Jim is also doing a whistleblower this week, and uh, he did 
a program yesterday that was uh, really excellent. So I uh, ask our listeners to tune in and listen to these other great radio pro- programs as well as mine. And, uh, Mary, I'd like to get back to what you were talking about. Now, you were talking about the important uh, strategic uh, location of Port Canaveral or, and, and how that really ties in with a lot of our military and security infrastructure. Yes, it's, it's where our space, um, air, and sea command. And so not only is, is NASA there and not only is the military sea lift command and the Trident submarines and NATO's Trident submarines, Port, you know, Cape Canaveral Air Force Base, Patrick Air Force Base, um, our Coast Guard, um, but there's also right there is a 36-acre petroleum tank farm which has 30, you know, 3 million barrels of petroleum sitting right there and jet fuel. And this also feeds up, it's a 50-mile pipeline that goes up to, um, from Seaport Canaveral right up to Orlando International Airport. So, you know, looking at a 36-acre uh, petroleum tank farm sitting there as well as everything else that is there, this is critical infrastructure, and it should have been managed appropriately. And the idea that you you cannot bypass CFIUS and say, oh, this is just a lease, that's completely ludicrous. It, that makes no, there's no common sense whatsoever, beyond which the 2007 FINSA law stated that a, a lease must be treated exactly as a purchase particularly at a military critical infrastructure port. You know, there's, there's also all the, um, the ships that pass through there with 8,000, six ships pass through the cruise ships that each have about 8,000 people on them. So that's another 48,000 people that are in those terminals per day. Well, so a lot of action going on there to have bypassed security. Yeah, it's pretty amazing that this all got circumvented not only by uh, the CFIUS process, but apparently uh, Hillary Clinton's State Department uh, had some input on this, as well as, of course, the uh, Uranium One deal. Those are the sorts of things that just kind of go uh, un- undetected or at least unrecognized uh, by the average American. But uh, this this process has really been hurt over the past eight years, and uh, frankly, I think uh, President Trump inherited a real mess because so many of these people are not only there, but they are entrenched in the government, and it's going to be really hard to get rid of them. They haven't gotten rid of them. In fact, John Solomon just broke the news uh, last night that they went to President Obama at the White House on the Uranium One deal with the information on CFIUS. And so how did that get bypassed when we found that Eamon Mir in the CFIUS process never mentioned Russia for the Uranium One deal, only Canada? Beyond that, we found out that he was the one who bypassed CFIUS for the Gulf Tainer deal. So here's your, your ISNA operative in charge of the process of CFIUS via his position at the Treasury Department. Now, Jack Lew knew exactly because he had flown to Sharjah and had meetings the week before the, the, the 35-year lease was handed off and signed. So he well knew who was involved because he was working for, on the um, Committee for National Security under Bill Clinton when Gulf Tainer went before Congress and the Treasury Department is an, part of an investigation for their, their WMD uh, oil for superweapons scheme. Which brings us back to Dr. Jaffer and Port Canaveral. Right. And that's Dr. Jaffer is a very interesting man. And as we looked into him and as we were um, briefing the people at the Center for Security Policy, I'll just tell you, as they read this information, and it's all documented and proven, they 
said that the hair on the back of their neck stood up. And you need to keep that in mind because if you have people who have worked their whole life in national security and, and intelligence and they find this that terribly concerning, you have to wonder why. And that's because of Dr. Jaffer. His, his career was spent working with the KGB. He studied in Moscow after he was turned down with a job at his university in Great Britain. He then went to CERN where the scientists reported him as a hostile actor who they felt was taking information in order to weaponize nuclear. Right. They, and I want our listeners to understand that CERN is where the uh, Super Collider Project is located. Uh, yes. One of the top nuclear uh, super collider programs, well, the really premier in the world. Mm-hmm. So Dr. Dr. Jaffer was there for four years, and the scientists wrote that they were afraid to report him because they thought he was a, a dangerous spy. Um, but they did write him up, and we did find those letters. Uh, but then Dr. Jaffer's career is pretty much spent working with Yegevni Primakov, who is a super spy who was the head of the KGB. He then become the um, ambassador, the Russian ambassador to Iraq, worked very closely with Saddam Hussein. In fact, he was helping Saddam build the nuclear pro- program for the, for the Russians and the Soviets. And um, he worked closely with uh, Yuri Andropov, who is also known as the butcher of Baghdad. Uh, Yegevni Primakov is also um, that his his goal in life was to destroy Israel and America. And what he did was he began building what's known as the Islamic Bloc. And he started putting together players in the Middle East, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Sudan. In fact, all the people that uh, President Obama just put on, on the list and he started um, working with them, this Islamic bloc. And the first thing they did was they knew that the, the Soviets, the Russians, couldn't beat us militarily. And so they needed another angle. And what they were doing was that they were creating seething hatred against the United States and Israel. And they were radicalizing Islam in order to create terrorists. So. They, would, they had a plan to take down America, you know, um, death by a thousand cuts, and that would be via terrorism. And I've, I've said before, it's important to keep in mind that radical Islam is a sort of communism. And that's what Yegevni Primakov was creating in his Islamic bloc, working with Dr. Jaffer and having meetings in the Middle East and putting all these players together to work together toward our destruction. Right, right. And I, I have to remind our listeners uh, that Yuri Andropov, who was the uh, Soviet premier uh, in the early 19, uh, 1980s, uh, he, he had a plan called the Andropov Plan. And under that, communism would be uh, worked into the American system through gradualism instead of direct con- confrontation, because he recognized that the Soviet Union uh, was nowhere nearly capable of tackling the United States militarily because we were so much more economically powerful. And I ask our listeners, please uh, go to uh, do your own little research project and look up Antonio Gramsci and the prison notebooks. and. And what uh, Yuri Andropov was doing was implementing uh, Gramsci's plan, which is uh, really a, a program of communism through uh, gradualism. Uh, sorry, Mary, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I no, want to make agree. sure our listeners realize how important Yuri Andropov is. As is Antonio Gramsci. Right, right. And his incrementalism, but uh, Gramsci also uses... Um, race 
to turn people against one another, and he thought that he would be very successful in implementing communism in the United States if he could turn the races against one another and, and create that division. Right, exactly. Which it seems we're watching that being put into play right now. So right, Yegevni right. Primakov not only then worked with, with Dr. Jaffer and the Islamic bloc, but then we find that the um, they have what's known as the Damascus meetings. And in the Damascus meetings, they were bringing in North Korea looking for a delivery system for a nuclear weapon that Dr. Jaffer had, had created. Dr. Jaffer had created a nuclear, and we have the plans, uh, a nuclear weapon, a miniaturized nuclear weapon known as beach ball. And so while we have the plans, as we started looking into what had actually taken place in Iraq, it was important to understand everything that had taken place in the run-up and as the coalition forces went into uh, Iraq and as they arrested Dr. Jaffer. Um, again, we find that, that Yuri, uh, excuse me, Yegevni Primakov was running the nuclear program with Dr. Jaffer and Saddam. He was bringing in materials, uh, to Iraq, he um, when we were coming in, he was also running a program of his generals on the ground in Iraq who were moving things out. They had um, it's reported 56 sorties of 727 and 747s that had been uh, everything had taken out so they could be used as cargo planes, and they were flying everything that the Russians and Saddam had built into Syria and into Iran. They had Russian generals on the ground, but it was very interesting that they were never allowed to wear any of their own apparel because we would be able to see through, via satellite what was happening on the ground. When um, they moved all this out, um, in fact, Yegevni Primakov, he was also using his own personal plane to take out any documentation. So it could, the plan, uh, the plans and all that the Russians had been working with for so many years with Saddam could not be found. So they were moving all that documentation out of the country as well. And this was right before uh, we uh, went into uh, Iraq in, in uh, 2002. This was right before we went in, and at the time that that was taking place, um, they also had the Russians, they were moving um, truckloads of all their material, not only out of the country, but it was moving in constant movement around the country. And um, there were then several um, physicists who defected and, and told of all the things that had taken place in the book, The Bomb in My Garden. Um, you know, there was a, a part to the nuclear reactor that was buried in his own, his own garden. So there's a, a lot of proof that there were nuclear weapons and there were other WMD, the biological and uh, the chemical weapons as well, with Dr. Tata and uh, Chemical Ali, who both worked for Dr. Jaffer. Dr. Jaffer didn't just have a program. He had a program that had um, over 20,000 uh, scientists and technicians that worked for him, and most of it was built underground. His program was, and the, the amount of people who worked for him was equal to the, the size of our CIA. Okay. Now, um, I guess, Alan, would you like to address the um, uh, connection here now with the uh, current uh, Putin administration and how uh, Club K and how some of these connections between Dr. Jaffer and some of the uh, uh, well, let's get into Rostec uh, and some of the connections that are so critical to Port Canaveral. Okay, great question. So it's interesting here we're talking about a company that's mostly from Iraq, but you're hearing the word Russia over again. So your listeners and all Americans really need to start to associate the phrase Islamic terrorism with Russia because they go hand in hand. Now, this is something 
that happened in the background. Russia is very good at operating in the background. Uh, they've never really come clean about how deeply they were involved in the Vietnam War. You know, that uh, we were losing a lot of our planes over there because of Russia's help or direct involvement in the Vietnam War. They play a background role um, that's much bigger than anyone realizes. Now, going back to Yuri Andropov and then later his protege, Primakov, they both recognized that this um, Islam and the Islamic political system could be used as a tool, like almost like an asymmetrical warfare method in which they could unleash this wave of terror against the U.S. and Israel to sort of chip away at our national security and create a more and more serious threat. Now, they, you know, they, they trained the head of the PLO, Yasser Arafat. Um, they had this university, uh, the Friendship University, Patrice Lumumba, where um, the leader of Iran uh, reportedly went. Actually, RT, the propaganda television station, admitted that. So Russia's been involved with terrorist states like the Palestinian Liber Liber excuse me, the PLO and uh, Saddam's regime for a long time. So when we found out that they had more recent deals with Russia, that makes sense because they've really been working together all along to the detriment of U.S. national security. Now, Russia, from the, from, you know, after World War II, I don't know whether they could have won a conventional war against the U.S., but they sent their spies in, like the Rosenbergs, and, the, and there were many, many others, as McCarthy was working on, to steal all of our national security secrets from the laboratories for the Manhattan Project, from Los Alamos, to accelerate their own nuclear program. But they didn't stop there. They're, they were sponsoring these terrorist regimes in Lebanon and uh, throughout the Middle East to attack Israeli targets and U.S. targets and other Western targets. And furthermore, Andropov knew that, that those places could eventually be targeted by the West like an invasion of Iraq, for example. So he needed to give them additional ways to defend themselves. So they came up with this idea that they would start nuclear programs under the guise of a peaceful energy program. Of course, you know, why do they need energy programs when they're sitting on all this oil? But nevertheless, they get reactors. They got guys like Dr. Jaffer training to then weaponize the nuclear technology to use those Manhattan Project secrets to start all these reactors throughout the Middle East and start working on delivery systems and weapons. Now, as Mary said, there's a lot of evidence that they uh, got a lot further with their nuclear program, may have actually had a working device. They had, it possibly were just in the final stages of gathering enough fuel for these nuclear weapons like the beach ball. But the delivery systems at the time, around 1990, for example, during the Gulf War, or even during the U.S. invasion in 2003. They were still looking at uh, systems like the Scud missile. They had met with the North Koreans on the Damascus meetings, and North Korea was actually ready to go and building a missile factory with a Korean missile in near Baghdad. So this was going to give them further delivery capability. Now, those are all more traditional weapons delivery systems. You got the ballistic missiles, which are your long range ones, and then you have your shorter range uh, Scud missiles. Now, somebody came up with the idea of putting a cruise missile in a container. And the Russian government has been working on this project for a while. It's been said by uh, one defense expert that had Saddam Hussein had a cruise missile in a container, that that actually might have been enough if they had been put in ports like Umm Qasar and on freighters in the Persian Gulf to have made it very difficult for U.S. forces to land in Iraq, very difficult for the Marine Corps amphibious landings to have happened. Our Navy ships and carriers could have been targeted. 
They didn't have it in 2003, but it wasn't more than about seven years before they announced a new weapon system called the Club K Container Cruise Missile System. What it is is a standard shipping container. Uh, typically, they're 40 feet. They also have longer 53-foot ones, but the Club K apparently is the 40-foot version of a container. Inside are four cruise missiles. Uh, they have the caliber cruise missile, and there's also a, another system. The caliber is known as the NATO codename is Sizzler. Um, and they've got uh, another uh, cruise missile system that they are adapting to it as well. But the caliber cruise missile is a very dangerous cruise missile. It's probably better than the U.S. Tomahawk, which is an older cruise missile. Now, the caliber can travel at a subsonic speed, or it can be... Uh, set up as a two-stage uh, weapon in which it launches at subsonic speed, gets its uh, targeting information from satellites, and then goes to a second stage where it becomes supersonic. And once you've got a supersonic cruise missile heading toward a carrier or maybe a submarine base, it's going to be very hard to uh, defend yourself against that. The weapon is so fast. These can be armed with conventional weapons, which are enough, just with the kinetic force of the uh, supersonic impact and, and conventional weapons to sink an aircraft carrier, just one or two of them. But they can also be upgraded with EMP weapons, which Dr. Peter Pry is an expert on that, or nuclear, uh, nuclear weapons. The EMP is a variation on that. But these are very dangerous. The container can come on a cruise ship, uh, excuse me, on a container ship, uh, come into a port of entry, and then be put on trains or onto uh, semi tractor trailers and moved anywhere. Now, Port Canaveral has admitted that the Customs and Border Patrol does not have the manpower to open up every container the Gulf Tainer brings in. Jay Johnson continuously defied congressional mandates to be scanning all the containers. So it's really unclear what. Gulf Tainers bring in, but it's very troubling that, that Dr. Jaffer's long involvement in WMDs and then giving these guys a container port is just right. really a bad idea. Well, now, and, the, um, I, I think it's important for listeners to realize, too, that uh, under the Obama administration, didn't they uh, reduce the amount of inspections and uh, virtually eliminate them in many cases? The, the program really, I don't think they, the Department of Homeland Security under Jay Johnson or Janet Napolitano really had any interest in protecting our ports or looking inside these containers. Yeah, that, that, was, uh, that was the impression that I got from it. So let's talk about Club K and the connections uh, between Club K and Russian intelligence and then how that all melds together with uh, the Middle Eastern uh, Gulf Tainer and, you know, how this all ties together. So the Club K system relies on a number of state-owned enterprises for its manufacture, for the manufacture of the cruise missiles, and for exporting this new weapon system to other states. Uh, it's all state-owned. Now, after the quote-unquote end of the Cold War, which, as we know, never really happened. Cold War has continued in just a different form. Uh, a lot of these companies were turned over to oligarchs. Then uh, Putin's uh, sort of tight-knit circle of KGB guys out of St. Petersburg all really took control of all these state-owned enterprises. So these weapons manufacturers and the exporter, which is Rostec, which is run by a KGB guy, and Rostec has a as a subsidiary called Rosso Boron Export, which exports the Club K system. These are all state-owned enterprises closely associated with Vladimir Putin. Now, Gulf Tainer is very closely associated with Vladimir Putin, as well as his, his deputy, Igor Sechin, who's, like Mary said, he's on the SDN list. So um, in around 2010, Gulf Tainer entered into a joint venture with Rostec's 
uh, financial arm, which is called Prominvest, which was set up as a special bank for Rostec, which 70% of their business is weapons, to basically be like a clearing bank for weapon sales to other countries. So Gulf Caner goes into a joint venture with them in which they then gain control of Usluga, which is a port in Russia and very close to St. Petersburg on the, uh, I guess that's the, uh, Balt- the Baltic Sea up there. And, uh, uh-huh. yeah, so they've gained control of that. So they're in this deal with part of Rostec, Prominvest, and then Rostec, meanwhile, is exporting the Club K system. So it's a very close relationship between the exporter of this new cruise missile system, which can be put on trains and tractor trailers and delivered anywhere in the U.S., and Gulf Caner. And they have a terminal where conceivably Club K units could actually come in off of container ships and then be sent on their way throughout North America. And Gulf Tainer actually controls about 40% of the ports in the Middle East, so they don't really have control of this Russian port, but they've got ports in Saudi Arabia, um, three ports, I think, in Saudi Arabia, um, as well as several in the UAE. They're in Turkey. Um, they have access to Pakistan. Um, they're pretty much the number one uh, container terminal operator in the region of the Middle East. Mm-hmm. Okay. I, you know, I'm, uh, while we're talking about this, I want to, you, you uh, pointed something out that I think it's important for our listeners to understand. The uh, so-called Cold War supposedly ended in 1991 with the uh, supposed fall of the Soviet Union. And what I want our listeners to understand is that communism right now is stronger worldwide than it has ever been, and it's been really implemented through the Uri and drop-off plan and how instead of uh, direct confrontation, it's being done uh, through subversive channels. And I'm going to make a quote here by Mikhail Gorbachev, and this is a speech before the uh, Soviet Politburo uh, on November 2nd, 1987. Quote, in October 1917, we parted with the old world, rejecting it once and for all. We are moving to a new world, the world of communism. We shall never turn off that road. Comrades, do not be concerned about all that you hear about glasnost and perestroika and democracy in the coming years. These are primarily for outward consumption. There will be no significant internal change within the Soviet Union other than for cosmetic purposes. Our purpose is to disarm the Americans and let them fall asleep, unquote. That, I think, is so important that our listeners understand that communism not only is not dead, it is right now stronger than it's ever been. Virtually all of uh, the continent of Africa uh, much of the the uh, uh, Far East and South America and Central America are now under communist or certainly heavy socialist control, as well as Europe. And we are becoming one of the very last countries in the world that has any kind of a Republican government. And, and keep in mind, too, that the enemies within have been implementing socialist programs in our country to the point where we're almost uh, completely away from what our founders intended. I I didn't mean to get off on a a separate little speech there, but I want people to understand that, uh, you know, what we hear from our so-called elected leaders and uh, from the lamestream media is not what the reality of our world really is. So let's talk about Club K and how these weapon systems can be scattered all over the country and where, in fact, they very well may be at this point in time. Mary, would you like to talk about that? Sure. The Club K, um, it's, it's very important that the that Gulf Caner has gone into a joint venture with Rostec, Rossobor, and Export, the exporter of the Club K. Um 
keeping in mind the Department of Homeland Security, even though there was a weapon of mass effect found in Port of San Diego that Barack Obama's administration covered up and fired the Homeland Security official when he let the cat out of the bag. Once the Club K, and so though Congress has mandated 100% of cargo containers coming into the country must be inspected, and less than 2% were, if even that amount, you have cargo containers coming into the country with no inspection, and then they get on railroad, riverines, trucks. They, so if something comes into the country in Port Canaveral, it can end up in any hamlet in America. They're, they have now full access with containers that are not being inspected. And as Dr. Peter Pry recently reported, the Club K was also sold to Iran, who's been practicing putting up EMPs. And and these containers, they get moved from one place to, the, to another. In fact, at Port Canaveral, there were many containers that were coming in, and we couldn't understand why all these containers were coming in from South America, and they were empty. So what were they moving into the United States that they were running all these empty containers in? The other thing is we found out that Gulf Tainer was buying all the refrigerated warehouses up the, up the East Coast. And uh, when they're buying all the refrigerated containers, you know, we noted that when they were moving WMD around the country in Iraq trying to hide it from the um, coalition forces and, as it came in, it was always being kept in refrigerated containers. So, again, we are wide open. We are flying blind, and no one is protecting our national security. To give a, a nuclear weapons mastermind who was on CENTCOM's blacklist, which means shoot to kill, to give him a 35-year lease with no security, national security re review, uh, the keys to the kingdom and putting them inside the wire is beyond. Uh, you can't make this yeah, this it's stuff up. Yeah, inconceivable. Yeah. Uh, I'll no, tell you, there's really another. Is, Marianne, I'm I'm sorry. Go ahead. There's another piece to this to this Gulf Tainer deal. As we started looking at Gulf Tainer, we started looking at some of their employees. And one of the men that we found that worked for him as their, their uh, director of strategic planning was Sai McNamazi. Sai McNamazi is a man who uh, holds dual citizenship to the United States of America and to Iran. He was a, uh, served in the Iranian army, which is really unusual that they gave him citizenship after he served in the Iran, you know, that he had citizenship and then went and served in the Iranian army. He was also a government official. Sam McNamazi founded NIAC. Now, he founded it with Trita Parsi. NIAC is considered the lobbying arm of Iran. In court documents, we found that Sam McNamazi was sending talking points to Trita Parsi, his partner that founded NIAC, National Iranian American Council, as Trita Parsi visited the White House 33 times during the making of the Iran deal, the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. So as Obama was putting together the Iran deal, Trita Parsi was visiting the White House, who's considered the Iran, you know, lobby, and with, with the explicit... Um, uh, the Iranian government, um, he was having lunch with Ahmadinejad and, and people who are, you consider is the people who are running Iran, um, and he's receiving secret talking points from Sam McNamazi, who's working for the Jaffers as this deal goes through. Now, as he he's the director of strategic planning, he's also going to uh, meetings on on the ports business. Sai McNamazi is in place the entire time as, 
is the Iran deal is putting through, which matches up timeline-wise, is the same time frame that the Port Canaveral deal is being put through. So a man who used to work for the Iranian government as an official and was in the Iranian army works for the Jaffers and is in contact with his partner at Nyack as he's entering the White House 33 times during for the Iran deal, and he is giving him talking points, telling him what to do, and that's proven in court documents where they release those emails. Wow. <clears throat> Amazing. Well, it puts... Well, uh, let's, let's talk about what this means uh, for our country, the fact that we have the potential of having all these weapon systems scattered all over our country and uh, really I'd like to talk about maybe some of the ways that we can uh, we can alert our Congress people and we can maybe get something done to uh, try to locate some of these some of these uh, potential uh, weapon systems well well I think this is something that definitely Congress needs to look at uh, right now, just like they're looking at the Uranium One situation. And unfortunately, three years has already passed. The port uh, terminal had their grand opening in the summer of 2015. That's when the first container ship came in. So they've had, since then, almost every week, they've had container ships coming in. So it's very troubling to think how much they could have uh, brought into the U.S. already. They've been trying to get a railroad connected directly to the terminal, uh, running that through Cape Canaveral Air Force Station and Kennedy Space Center. And that is actually making its way through uh, the regulatory environmental impact statements and that sort of thing. Uh, so they want that would give them uh, even more capability to get containers moved uh, into the intermodal network, the rail system. Right now what they do is they uh, have the semi-trucks come in. They can put them on the trucks there and then uh, take them nearby to the rail yard and get them put on trains there. But it's, a, it's really basically the same problem. Now, people in the defense community uh, realize that the Club K is an asymmetrical weapon and they don't really have a good handle on it right now. They don't know how many there are, which countries have them. Congress, under the Defense Authorization Act, NDAA, is supposed to be notified anytime Russia sells this new system to another country. Um, Peter Pry had his intelligence uh, sources that had said that Iran had obtained the Club K system. So if you look at the millions of containers that are in the U.S. and just you know, just go down an interstate and you're going to see them. Um, it's really a big problem. And uh, they're going to, it's going to take a lot of cooperation between um, people who know how to, you know, do the satellite tracking, um, on the ground intelligence, uh, and actual physical inspections of these containers. It's a huge undertaking. And we're basically a couple years behind already. This should never have happened. So we're basically going to have to clean up this mess before something really bad happens. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's important for Americans to realize, and this has historically been the case, Russians play chess, and, and we play checkers. And uh, the fact is is that they have been thinking strategically for a very long time in ways to win the Cold War because they know they can't do it through their traditional uh, communist system on an economic scale because individualism and capitalism uh, beats communism every time in uh, you know an open economy and an open society. But uh, they can win the war if they can do it strategically. And I think our listeners need to realize that there's been a very false paradigm about communism uh, for the last 50 years, and especially for the last 25 or 30. 
and we really need to understand that there are things out there that are changing so quickly uh, and, and we don't have really a good handle on you know some of the programs because we are so trusting in, in so many ways. Uh, one of the things I have to also mention is the fact that Russia has completely upgraded their nuclear program, their missile systems are completely upgraded and in fact they have three times as many missiles now as we do and yet we supposedly won the Cold War and our systems have been reduced in quantity and most of our systems are at least 40 years old. Um, so, Mary, um, let, would you kind of inter interject what you think can be done to try to track down some of these uh, uh, containers? And I know uh, you've helped me get uh, Dr. Peter Pry lined up for uh, Thursday program on the 30th uh, on Republic News Network. I'm going to be doing a program with him and Claire Lopez uh, to talk about the uh, electromagnetic pulse weapon systems that are now uh, certainly capable of taking out our entire infrastructure nationwide. Well, there's a co couple of things we can do. There are, there are a couple, very few people in Congress that I would suggest getting in touch with right now. One of them is um, Congressman DeSantis. Congressman uh, Louis Gohmert, Congressman Jim Jordan, uh, Congressman Gates, and um, from Florida. Those men um, have stood up and are demanding that the details of the Uranium One deal, and they, uh, they know about the Gulf Tainer deal now. And those that have been briefed are incredibly disturbed. Uh, it's important for your listeners to understand when we first started looking into this, we spoke to um, the foremost authority on, on ports and airports and security, and that's, his name is Glenn Wynn, and he was the man who had overseen what had taken place at um, Port of San Diego when uh, weapons of mass effect came in. And he said, you know, there, it's, it's like a needle in a haystack to know what's in every container, so you really... The, it's so important to know who you're giving uh, leases to. So the idea that they didn't check out, you know, it's it's not even possible to believe when they'd already had them under investigation. They knew that they were SDNs, that they gave these people contracts. So this couldn't be a mistake. Right. And so it has to be walked back. There is something that is a, uh, a new device which can um, measure particles in the air and should be able to be used with these containers. But it has to, you cannot take out a city. You can't just say, well, we can't do this. We'll just have to see what city gets taken out. Or, you know, beyond uh, some sort of a weapon, biological or chemical, we have to have a secure country. You know, right now what we're watching, what just took place and where NATO has been neutered by everything that took place with the bogus Arab Spring and flooding the country with armies of people who didn't, don't hold true uh, to their belief systems. And I'm not talking religion. I'm, I'm talking their political systems. Um, it's important to understand that the UAE has taken over most of the British ports. If you don't own your ports, and if you understand um, the art of war and Sunset at all, what, your ports are an incredibly important um, national security uh, that they must be taken care of. You must know who's in your ports, who's coming into your ports, who's running your ports. You don't just hand them over to anyone. In fact, you don't, the United States has plenty of people and, who could use jobs and build businesses and should be building ports businesses ourselves. We should not be handing these over to foreign entities at all. Well, I, I dare say that I think this is all part of the uh, ultimate plan for uh, globalism, for global government. But 
yeah. you know, you're right. You're right. If we care anything about our country, uh, we should be controlling all the items that are part of national security. I couldn't agree more, Dan. But I also think when people talk about globalism, I really wish they'd start thinking and remembering that when they're talking about globalism, it's not just the financial aspects and the deals. It's global communism. Exactly. No, that's exactly right. Uh, if we look at the structure of the United Nations, I mean, I you know, that's a whole other program in itself. But mm -hmm. it has been, it was uh, designed under communism. The model is communist. Even the... Uh, the head uh, head of state of the uh, UN has a communist designation uh, as far as a leadership role. They, there is so much there that uh, you know is all tied in with this stuff, and I don't think people realize just exactly how how totally controlling this whole process really is. Yeah, I think it's important if they really want to understand the background of what's taken place is to read Golitsyn's um, Perestroika Deception and Pasipa's Disinformation because Americans are not being told the truth. And I'm not sure how many of our um, bureaucrats understand what's taking place either. No, I agree. I mean, as a matter of fact, I've got those two books right here in front of me. And uh, I was going to mention those, so no. I'm glad you said that, Mary. Um, we, we need to understand just exactly how devastating it would be if, in fact, we were to have uh, an electromagnetic pulse weapon system within our country and, and they could uh, detonate it. And I think our listeners need to understand we do have... ICBM, we do have uh, satellite capability to take out West weapon systems that are attacking from the outside of the country, but we don't have anything. That's a Trojan horse. We don't have any way of protecting against those devices if they come from within our own country. No, and Dr. Price said, you know, had this happened with the greatest generation, they would have secured the grid already. The idea that we haven't secured the grid is just suicidal it's it's this is unacceptable what's taken place and um the american people had better get busy and as general valley says stand up america this is your country and remember that those people in washington dc they work for you we don't work for them right. take back your country right right that is well alan uh would you like to uh, maybe talk about uh, what you see as a way that we can take back some of our ports. Is there a way that we can affect through our intelligence community a reversal of some of these policies like uh, what happened to hand Port Canaveral over to uh, the Jafar family? Sure. And I'd like to actually extrapolate a little bit on what Mary said answering your previous question. I think the worst sort of doomsday scenario that we're looking at, and this is partly after we studied the military doctrine that's coming out from the military journals in Russia right now that uh, some folks are translating. And they see the caliber cruise missile and basically Russia's cruise missile system as sort of the next generation of strategy moving away from the ICBMs because we're, you know, we've got a lot of, in place to detect ICBMs coming in and to at least have some sort of a chance to defend ourselves against them. The cruise missiles are shorter range delivery systems. Now, Russia's been retrofitting their submarines with cruise missiles like the Calibers, which is the same cruise missile that goes into the Club K container, not only on the Russian boats, we're talking submarines, but also their surface ships, you know, the corvettes, the, the frigates, um, the, uh, they're basically their, their navy, and uh, Russia's allies like Vietnam, uh, Iran, North Korea, they're all moving toward cruise missiles too. So sort of the doomsday scenario that's really the most uh, alarming is a simultaneous coordinated attack from Russia, Iran, 
China, Vietnam, and uh, maybe a few other countries using a combination of cruise missiles launched from submarines off the Pacific Gulf and Atlantic coasts, from surface ships, from freighters that are containing that have containers on board launching Club K uh, cruise missiles uh, toward the U.S. mainland and Hawaii and our bases overseas. And then these containers that have been moved into the interior close to our military facilities, like let's say major Air Force base or major Army base deep within the interior. Uh, they could also target Washington, D.C. They could take out uh, major infrastructure. And then, of course, with the EMPs, they could take down our power grid. If this all happened on a sort of a Pearl Harbor type of attack, we'd be really crippled within, it could all happen within 30 minutes or a few hours. And uh, the tide of World War III could really turn before we've even really realized that we were in World War III. So wow, that's sort of that's, that's sort of the thought. fear of a worst case scenario. Yeah, that's a heavy thought. Well, um, I would like to uh, maybe approach, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what you see as a possibility of taking, uh, you know, some of these ports back in in ways that we can do better inspection procedures. And then I'd like to give you guys a, a chance to uh, tune our listeners into some of your. Uh, websites and some of the projects that you're working on so that they can uh, really follow what you're doing much more closely? Well, I think the U.S. needs to go all the way, and Congress needs to go ahead and pass a law that all U.S. ports need to be under the control of U.S. operators. And this means getting China out of our ports. This means getting the UAE out of the ports. So this would be going up against... Um, you know, the Chinese who have control of these ports in California, like I think it's Los Angeles, Long Beach, um, and Dubai Ports World has Vancouver right over the border up in Canada, so that's really Canada's deal. But this this um, strategy, if you even want to call it that, which England has and the British have followed, which is to hand over all their ports to foreign countries, this is... This is the sort of logic that makes no sense, that they knew this a thousand years ago. You don't give your ports away to the enemy. That's just not – there's no sense to it. And, and we've been brainwashed into thinking that America can't do anything anymore, that we don't have the capability to run these uh, gantry cranes and take boxes on and off of ships. Uh, we should be doing this, and this needs to be mandated that we have control of all these. They need to unwind all these deals. And I think Gulf Caner could be the case where they went too far. And once the public understands what this threat is, they're going to understand that we need to get these foreign operators out of there. That includes the communist Chinese. It's just too dangerous. Now, Mary's got her website, theamericanreport.org. Uh, I'm the founder of another website called 1776 Channel. That's at 1776 Channel. Dot com. So we've published our work on those two sites. Also, uh, we've released two papers at the Center for Security Policy. Uh, so you can review some of our work there. But it's really to go through the whole history of our work on Gulf Caner, go to the American Report and 1776 channel. Okay, good. Well, I'll tell you, you folks are uh, a real uh, credit to the uh, – the people in our country that are concerned about the direction that we're heading, or we certainly were heading under the Obama administration, and I think you're going to be critical in the uh, expose and the fight to get our country back, and I certainly hope that President Trump is uh, hearing some of the concerns that you are trying to put before the American people, and that's all we'll do. We'll continue to have these radio shows with the idea that we're going to expose just exactly how deep the rabbit hole goes. That's uh, that's part of the red pill experience. So um, I, I want to thank both of you for your, not only for your bravery in, in exposing a lot of the stuff, but for the fact that you do such a good job and such an articulate job of uh, letting America know what's uh, happening in our own in our own country. 
and uh, I ask that you possibly uh, consider being back on at some point. We can uh, talk about this further. Uh, we'd love to. Thank you again, and uh, Mary and Alan, and uh, we'll look forward to the next time we speak. Pleasure.